you join me in prayer? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As Tom pointed out, we do love our superheroes. Marvel and DC Comics are enjoying incredible resurgence as feature-length movies depicting their comic book superheroes have flooded theaters. Deadpool, one of the X-Men characters, broke box office records for highest grossing R-rated films when it opened in theaters last weekend. Batman vs. Superman is scheduled to open next month. I'm pretty excited about that. Last year's features included the Fantastic Four, Ant-Man, and the Avengers. Superheroes have superpowers that exceed the limitations of us mere mortals. They have special strengths, special characteristics, special senses, special knowledge that enable them to do things that no one else can do. Iron Man has this amazing suit of armor that enables him to fly, makes him impervious to missiles, and arms him with an incredible array of weapons. Captain America is this courageous soldier with a shield that is indestructible. The Hulk is capable of unleashing uncontainable fury when his anger is provoked. Wonder Woman has Amazonian strength. The Flash has supersonic speed. The Black Widow has stealth. Captain Marvel has concussive blasts. This season, Superwoman has her own TV show along with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. We do love our superheroes. Time after time, we cheer them on as they rush in at the last possible moment to save the day with their superpowers. But today, what makes me nervous is that we seem increasingly inclined to attribute superhero qualities on the people we rely on in real life. We attribute superhero qualities to our political candidates as they promise to single-handedly restore America's greatness or turn the tide for the shrinking middle class. They don't have to talk about building coalitions and winning necessary votes in Congress to turn their proposals into policy. They can use their superhero powers to fulfill all of the promises that they make. We attribute superhero powers to our medical doctors whose surgical skills and miracle pills can erase Years of physical neglect and inactivity turn back the effects of aging and restore our bodies to perfect health. We attribute superhero status to Wall Street financial gurus who can create wealth out of paper, impact national economies with electronic transactions, and predict market trends that mystify mere mortals. We attribute superhero powers to CEOs who command obscene salaries because of their abilities to single-handedly improve the profitability reported on the quarterly earnings reports of the corporations that they lead. superheroes have superpowers that can deliver us from whatever crisis we're facing. They 
can protect us from whatever danger is threatening us. They can help us accomplish great things that none of us can ever accomplish on our own. We place tremendous confidence in our superheroes and trust that they can deliver us in our moments of great need. Unfortunately, superheroes only exist in comic books and movie theaters. There are no superheroes in real life. There are only ordinary people who occasionally do heroic things. That's the lesson that our tradition reminds us of in the biblical story of the golden calf. It's an important story for us to remember as we journey through the wilderness places of our lives because wilderness is fraught with tremendous peril and uncertainty and it is easy for us to be tempted to attribute superhuman powers to the people we hope can lead us out of the wilderness and into the promised land. That's how the Hebrew people ended up bowing down to a golden calf and dancing for joy before it, believing that the figure Aaron had molded from their melted jewelry could keep them safe and secure. It seems absurd that such a bizarre thing took place so soon after Moses came down from the top of the mountain with the commandments that defined their new covenant with God. Just eight chapters earlier, they had a great ceremony in which all the Hebrew people vowed to be faithful to God and obedient to the commandments. Moses came down from the mountain and told the people all of the ordinances that God expected them to keep, and all of the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And then Moses sacrificed an ox as a thank offering. And he splashed half of the blood of the sacrifice onto the altar. And the other half he poured into basins. And then he took the blood and dashed it on the people and said, See the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. It was a messy, gross gory, memorable moments that I'm sure no one soon forgot, dripping with the blood of the sacrifice. And yet just eight chapters later in this passage we read today, it is as if none of those things had ever happened. In just eight chapters, the Hebrew people went from vowing their eternal faithfulness to God, to dancing before a golden calf and worshiping it as their God. How could things go so wrong for them so quickly? At first, I attributed it to impatience. Moses kept them waiting too long. According to the text, he was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights is biblical code language for a really long time. It's also the language associated with the story of the great flood. When God saw the sinful nature of the people on earth, God sent the waters of the great flood to cover the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, the parallels between these two stories is striking. You can practically hear the scary music queuing up in the background because you know something bad is going to happen. 40 days was too long for Moses to be out of touch, especially in the wilderness. It wasn't like the people were relaxing in an all-inclusive resort while they waited for Moses. They were foraging for food and water every day just to keep the multitude alive. Impatience was rising as they remained stuck in one place. They weren't 
making any progress. They weren't getting any closer to the promised land. They weren't seeing any signs of hope that their dreams of a better life were coming to fruition. There was no word coming down from the mountain. No progress reports, no estimates of how much longer Moses was going to be. At first I thought it was their impatience that led them to form the golden calf. But then I thought it was much more likely that it was their insecurity that caused them to ask Aaron to make another god for them. They were just getting to know God. It was still all very new to them. Moses had just given them the commandments. They had just held their ceremony promising their faithfulness. It was, it was still early in the courtship phase of their relationship with God. Do you remember what that was like for you? Courtship takes a lot of attention. We write love letters every day when we're courting. We call each other on the phone every night before we go to sleep. We take every opportunity to be together whenever we can when we are in courtship. It must have been devastating to have been left in the dark for so long during the courtship stage of their relationship with God. It must have felt as if God was breaking up with them. We do not know what has become of him, cried the people. Perhaps their insecurity ran wild and led them to believe that God had given up on them when Moses was delayed. But the longer I sat with this text this past week, the clearer it became to me that it wasn't their impatience and it wasn't their insecurity that led them to make a golden calf. It was because they had turned Moses into a superhero. They had put their trust in him instead of God. Listen carefully to what the people said when they approached Aaron with their request. Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Do you hear the problem there? The Hebrew people thought that Moses had brought them out of their bondage in Egypt and led them through the parted waters of the Red Sea and gave them water from a rock and fed them with manna from heaven. But Moses wasn't a superhero. He was just an ordinary person who at times behaved heroically. He was willing to act on faith, to risk appearing foolish, to speak truth to power, to advocate on behalf of the oppressed. Moses lived an inspiring life, but he was not a superhero. He had no superhuman powers, but because people attributed superhero status to Moses, they quickly lost hope when they imagined Moses was gone. No one could take Moses' place. 
No one could do what Moses had done for them. There wasn't another superhero among them. And so they turned to Aaron to create a new god out of their most precious possessions. What the Hebrew people had forgotten was that it was God who delivered them out of their bondage in Egypt. It was God who had turned the heart of Pharaoh. It was God who had opened a way for them to move through the Red Sea. It was God who made water flow from a rock to quench their parched throats. It was God who fed them with manna from heaven. Moses didn't do any of those things. He was simply the person whom God had called to lead the community. He was a faithful and courageous leader, but he wasn't a superhero. There were no superheroes accompanying the Hebrew people through their wilderness wanderings. There was only God and ordinary people who, from time to time, Behave heroically. The Hebrews didn't need another God. They needed another Moses. And Aaron was no Moses. Aaron was too eager to give the people what they wanted. To please them to do whatever was necessary to remain in their favor. Moses had never been afraid to express his anger towards his people when they disappointed him because he held them to a higher standard. They weren't just a band of escaped slaves. They had entered into a covenant with God, and Moses expected the Hebrew people to live as a nation of priests, as God's holy representatives on earth. He expected them to be faithful to the laws of the covenant, even when it was hard. Aaron, on the other hand, was eager to go along with whatever the majority of people wanted to do. When they came to him asking him to make gods who will go before us, Aaron didn't invoke the commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Even though God had insisted you shall not make for yourselves an idol, Aaron agreed to take their precious metal and cast it into a golden calf. They didn't need another god. They needed another leader whose life was deeply rooted in prayer. A leader who would not bend the wishes and whims of the people, but one who would hold them to a higher standard, who would remain steadfast in obedience to the will of God. They needed someone to remind them that it was God, not Moses, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. It seems absurd to gather up jewelry and mold it into a golden calf in hopes that it could possess superpowers. But we do that every day. We turn buildings into golden calves, convincing ourselves that a, a structure of brick and mortar can be a church as if a place in and of itself could transform people's lives to more fully embody the love of God, the love of neighbor, the love of self. Turn wealth 
into golden calves, believing that as long as our invested funds continue to provide good returns, that all will be well and we will find our way through the wilderness. We turn leaders into golden calves, believing that as long as they're with us, everything will be all right. And we convince ourselves that no one could possibly do what they can do. A golden calf becomes an idol instead of a statue when we attribute superpowers to it. It's a tendency that we constantly have to be on guard against, especially in the wilderness where impatience and insecurity are high. Superheroes only exist in comic books and cinema screens. There are no superheroes in real life. In this world, there is only God. And ordinary people like you and I who from time to time, are capable of doing heroic things.